Okay, good morning to everyone. Um, and welcome to the seminar series of this year. Um, for our first talk, we have um, an invited talk from uh, Barcelona, and um, which is going to be shared by Jan Apchi. Uh, the title of uh, his talk is uh, Fishing Spintronic with the Rare Iron Garnets. Okay, a bit of, um, of Jan. Uh, he's a principal investigator at the Institute of Material Science of uh, Barcelona. Um, he got his uh, PhD from ETH Zurich in 2015. Uh, he um, they got a, a postdoc position in at MIT and also at the ETH uh, Zurich okay, in between 2016 and 2021. And in 2021, he also got the uh, UPAP uh, Young Scientist Prize in the field of and um, and um, thank you, Jan, for sharing your work with uh, with our group. So you you are welcome to start uh, whenever you want. Thank you very much, Luis, for this nice introduction. I'm uh, trying to share my screen. So now do you see uh, the presenter mode or the uh, slide or the normal mode? Hello. Okay. No, no, it's, it's not in presentation. Switch, swap uh, screen. So do I, so is it okay or is it, uh, is it not okay? It's in the, in the you need to, to, to switch. Is not in the in the presentation mode yet. Okay. Okay. What about now? Uh, uh, wait. I think it's loading. Uh, can Can you switch? We are still seeing the the. We are not seeing a full screen. It's okay. Thank you. Oh, perfect. So, yeah. Let's uh, start over. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Luis, for this to this seminar series that you're organizing. And yeah, my name is John uh, Avci. I'm working at the Institute of Material Science of Barcelona uh, since 2021. Um, so the title is Efficient Spintronics with Rare Earth Iron Garnets. And this presentation includes uh, results from my postdoc time at MIT and later on at ETH Zurich and also some of the most recent results that we've got here at IPMA, uh, in Barcelona. So, so a little bit of uh, my uh, research team. So I am part of this large uh, 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 called Multox. So this is laboratory for multifunctional tin tunes and complex structures. I, I think I've already invited some of the some of the members from Multox before uh, to uh, to this seminar series. And uh, so we are we are a kind of relative information on. Uh, so the recording was stopped for my talk is the following. So we, I will briefly introduce uh, like some trends in the electrical control of magnetization. So why it's important 
and why it's uh, you know the history of it a little bit. And then I'm going to mention uh, discuss some uh, rare earth, rare earth iron garnets and its relationship with spintronics. Uh, later on, I'm going to give some uh, experimental overview of current induced magnetization switching and domain wall motion experiments, uh, always using rare earth iron garnets. Then I'm going to show you some, uh, uh, you know, a new uh, effect, a new uh, physical phenomenon that we call thermal spin drag. And in the last slide, I'm just going uh, just going to show you uh, some future directions that you know uh, spintronics can benefit uh, from rare earth iron garnets. So the first one. So today we are surrounded with uh, many new technological concepts such as uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, so let me do this. Maybe it's easier. Cryptocurrency, uh, social media, artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, personal electronic devices or like Internet of Things or Industry 4.0. And, you know, um, name, I mean, you can name uh, many of these technological uh, developments these days. So these seemingly unrelated but individually important topics have one thing in common. They depend heavily on the generation, processing, and manipulation of digital data. When I say heavily, I mean billions and trillions of, you know, ones and zeros are processed every single second. Data is, uh, uh, you know, typically uh, stored either locally on your personal electronic devices, but, but most of your data actually are stored in large data centers, uh, which uh, nowadays we call the cloud. So these cloud storage or most of your personal storage, they depend, you know, they have been relying for a very long time on hard disk drives. Actually, the cloud storage is still relying on hard, hard disk drives. So this uh, classical picture that you might remember from, you know, from the last decade, and uh, the, the principal operational principle of this, uh, um, you know, of this hard disk drive is, uh, is that it, the information is stored in magnetic domains, which is basically uh, written by some magnetic fields and uh, it is detected by this tiny uh, giant magnetic resistance repair. So uh, this kind of storage, it allows cheap and effective solution to store uh, digital uh, uh, data, which is still the main technology used today in data centers. So the Spintronics research that, as we know, is, as you know it today, it uh, officially started with the discovery of this uh, effect that is giant magnetic resistance effect, which you might be all familiar, uh, you might be familiar uh, with. So this JMR, it basically, it helped increase the magnetic data density in, in this, uh, this drives. Um, but the problem is that in this kind of approach, this conventional, approach, the uh, reading, the storage elements, and the writing might have ultimately combined operations, which kind of compromise their size, speed, or power efficiency. So uh, we need some solid state approaches to the data storage where the data can be both stored, read, and written in by electrical means. So these all, all three aspects that are separate, they should be combined so that we have some universal memory type device, which can be, uh, you know, highly efficient and, you know, can be uh, is scalable. Uh, it can be made very small, can be made very fast and can be made very uh, energy efficient, okay? So in this, in this uh, quest, the first uh, major breakthrough was basically uh, using the spin transport torque. So spin transport torque has been predicted around the mid 1990s, uh, you know, around uh, 30, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, it is basically uh, the, the torque that is exerted by a conduction charge carrier or electron in this case, where the spin of each electron can transmit some torque onto local magnetization. And this kind of concept has been used for, uh, for instance, controlling magnetic tunnel junctions or spin valve devices, or also displace domain walls in a single thermal unit layer. 
And based on this kind of concept, some uh, you know uh, memory devices uh, such as uh, magnetic random access memory has been developed. But lately, there is a new trend. So this new trend is basically is today or in the last decade that least the new trend of controlling the magnetization relies on uh, the so-called spin-orbit torques. Uh, spin-orbit torques have emerged as a powerful and versatile tool to control magnetization in a single ferromagnetic element because in the case of you know, spin valve, you need two ferromagnetic elements and you need to have a lot of engineering, but in spin transport torque, spin-orbit torque is much easier because you need to have single ferromagnetic element and you need to have, uh, send an in-plane current into that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, high layer system, and you can already exert very strong torques due to, uh, you know, strong damping like torque with the symmetry. Like this is the, uh, you know, the arrows show the effective field and the torque direction. Damping like torque can feed like torque on the magnetization based on uh, some physical phenomena such as spin hall effect. Rise by the Stein effect or topological bulk and surface states in certain materials, or you know, more recently, I call it the color. So, um, this kind of experiment has been basically, uh, you know, the this first discovery dates back to 2011 on a simple bilayer system called like platinum cobalt with uh, some oxide uh, capping. But nowadays, there's a you know there's a large amount of literature that you can read about spin orbit or uh, magnetization switching or uh, you know control of magnetization or the wall motion. So these kind of spin orbit torques can be very precisely detected in uh, by using some uh, uh, harmonic effect uh, measurements. So what you need to do is basically take your system, say, let's say normal metal ferromagnet and an oxide you make a uh, you know whole bar device like uh, the one shown here and based on you know this uh, system shows like an electrical you know the, the whole effect measurements uh, give uh, is proportional to the out of plane and in plane magnetization component in this spin orbital characterization which i'm not going to uh, go into detail today but just just to give you some feeling about it is that what uh, the measurement of spin orbit torque it relies on an ac current injection into a system like this and this ac current generates an ac uh, spin orbit torque on the magnetization which basically generates some oscillation to the magnetization so this is not like a resonant oscillation this is non-resonant so it's like a direct consequence of generating an AC, a low frequency AC uh, field on the magnetization. And these kind of oscillations can be detected by uh, using a second harmonic detection method. And by doing some analysis using both the first harmonic uh, signal, all the pole effect signal and the second harmonic pole effect signal, you can get an ex exact number of signal report values in a given system. So this has been well established since you know back in 2012, 2013, since my PhD times. But uh, just very recently, so as I told you that I'm not going to explain in detail, just very recently we, we just uh, published a paper, so you can also find it on archive, that uh, this kind of spin orbit torque detection uh, can be adapted to systems with very small whole effect uh, uh, response. So if you have it out, getting disturbed by uh, experimental noise or by some spurious thermoelectric effects. So if, if you are curious about it, you can go check this paper. Okay, so now, now let's deep dive into the rare earth iron garnets and why it's important for spin torques. So uh, a brief uh, story. Magnetic garnets have been known and studied for more than 60 years. So their bulk properties are well, well understood. I'm particularly interested in rare earth iron garnets with this general formula here. Uh, in the complex unit shell, uh, unit cell of garnets, the magnetic ions occupy, uh, you know, this iron uh, three plus occupy this side. So you know, there's a complex complex unit cell, but you know, in the simplistic scenario, you have these three occupations side. One is a tetrahedral side. One is the octahedral side. You have, you have the iron ions, iron which are uh, uh, coupled anti-parallel to each other, so they have anti-paramagnetic coupling. 
And you have this third side, which is dodecahedral side. And this one can, if you put like a rare earth or magnetic rare earth element over there, like terbium or thulium or europium, then this also will contribute to the magnetization. So this will couple um, uh, antiparallel to this tetrahedral side, and you will get some like a complex behavior between the two. So overall, uh, what happens is that because you can change this uh, dodecahedral side uh, element here, uh, you can also control very well the magnetization behavior as a function of temperature because depending on the element, the temperature dependent of dependence uh, of the magnetization will be very different. So you can get, for example, magnetic compensation at different temperatures, uh, and but independently of you know touching the Curie temperature, which always remains above 550 Kelvin, which is more than enough for room temperature applications. So th that's you know the beauty of this. Uh, where at Iron Garnets is that you can easily, you know, although it looks complicated, you can easily engineer the magnetic uh, properties. So this, uh, you know, this flexibility with the engineer of magnetic properties uh, can be used for uh, various aspects. For instance, uh, for certain rare earth iron garnets, such as yttrium iron garnet, you have extremely low damping. So that is good for certain type of, you know, high frequency uh, applications. Then the anisotropy of these garnets can be uh, tuned, as I will explain more in detail later on. So you can make it either in plane or out of plane anisotropy. Then you can also uh, tune the saturation magnetization at a given temperature or magnetic compensation temperature, or also the angular momentum compensation temperature, which is TA, which can be a little bit different than the magnetic compensation temperature. And this angular momentum compensation temperature is especially important for triggering uh, ultra fast uh, antiferromagnetic like dynamics in this system. On the structural side, so they are basically, they are grown epitaxially on DVD, so they, they have minimum amount of defects in the crystal, so which makes it very appealing for from uh, reproducibility on, and the technological aspects. They also gives you some flexibility in terms of device design, because you can, since these are all like uh, natural oxides, they don't, they are not affected by the uh, environment, so they don't get oxidized or anything. You know they don't age easily so i can still measure my samples from 2016 and they are in perfect conditions so uh, that's why you can also put some metallic bars in random positions and just throw that specific location electrically without really doing any any type of uh, complicated patterning so all these aspects are basically giving rise to multiple advantages i'm listing here for uh spring applications so in the past couple of years, there has been, uh, you know, but these advances have been very uh, uh, appealing for scientists, especially for, for uh, in the uh, past couple of years, there has been really fast progress in uh, getting these ultra-thin uh, garnet films, especially ultra-thin garnet films with perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, because perpendicular anisotropy is particularly appealing if you want to do some domain wall motion or race track memory, or, uh, you know, it's it's good in general for uh, long-term uh, data retention or for memory or for logic type applications in the spin point. So therefore, it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a property that you are we are looking after. And, uh, you know, starting with the earlier work that we have done at MIT in 2016, there has been a very, you know, like a broad interest and also uh, effort in making these ultra thin fields of uh, different rare earth iron garnets, all of them with perpendicular anisotropy and also with different deposition techniques, such as, I mean, most of the time when I don't mention anything, it's a, a false laser deposition, but there's also uh, some efforts to uh, produce these films by magnetron sputtering, and which is important because usually post laser deposition is relatively uh, slow and it generates films on, on a, a small uh, surface area. And but if you can produce these films with, with magnetron uh, magnetron sputtering, so it's a it's an added value, so it's an advantage for uh, industrial applications if any in the future. So. Um, I'm going to basically uh, in the last couple of slides, or let's not update, but let's say uh, 
this is paper that we just very recently published uh, in my group where we studied Kirby Myron Garnet uh, uh, spot I mean, obtained by magnetron spectrum. Okay, one thing I forget to mention, of course, this perpendicular isotropy in this field, they are uh, related to the strain state. So in the case of full Kirby Myron Garnet, for instance, you grow them on a typical GGG substrate, so gadolinium gallium garnet. And because of the lattice mismatch, you get some strain. So this compressive strain in turbimiring garnet, it drives the magnetization from in plane to out of plane so that the field gets perpendicularly magnetized. And uh, this is basically uh, something that you can easily engineer in the fields. So as uh, you know, as customary in you know any kind of material development. So we started by growing some turbimiring garnet on GGG the typical GGG substrates, uh, first at room temperature. And as you can see from uh, uh, from this uh, two theta omega scan, uh, XRD scans of the films, you see that you see that this, these large peaks correspond to the, uh, to the um, substrate. And this line corresponds to the bulk turbine absent at room temperature because these films, they need to uh, be uh, you know grown either at high temperature or annealed at high temperature to to get the you know the, the correct uh, crystal phase. So uh, what I'm showing you here is that at room temperature or at 700 degrees Celsius, Celsius annealed uh, films they don't show any uh, crystal structure. So if they are either amorphous or full crystal polycrystalline, uh, but starting from 750 degrees Celsius annealed, uh, you see that there is this large uh, you know peaks that are that correspond to the strained turbine garnet because i see i tell them i test strained because they, the peak they do not correspond to the bulk value but rather something that is on this side which basically means that they are strained um so we could also do that uh we realized that basically we uh Instead of annealing, so this all these AAA moves that annealed, we can also grow the film at higher temperature and get even better, better, uh, you know, a more pronounced XRD peaks. So this is some attempts that we did on, on standard GGG with 750 degrees Celsius, the black one. As you see, that there's a really nice, you know, this, this uh, XRD uh, signal. But also, uh, to our surprise, we also tried on different uh, GGG uh, substrate with different lattice parameters. And uh, although, you know, it seemed like, you know, the, even though the lattice parameter was somewhat, uh, you know, in a standard GGG, we have this lattice parameter, 12.38. In a bulk, we have 12.46. So that's why we get the strain. But we got strain state even with uh, other type of GGG, which are not, you know, non-standard and which are larger lattice parameters. So that was to our surprise. But this means that we can get PMA basically in, all kinds of GGG substrates. We also studied the target to substrate uh, distance, basically meaning that, you know, like by changing this distance between the material from which we are sputtering and the substrate that we are sputtering onto. And that also did not show much influence, so just a slight shift in the strain state or slight change in the strain state. So this uh, concludes that all pin grown or annealed at about uh, 750 degrees Celsius show compressive strain and they should show perpendicular magnetic and isotropy. Um, and uh, the films that, that are grown at higher temperature rather than grown at room temperature and then annealed later, they show basically more pronounced XRD uh, data indicating higher quality. And the uh, typical uh, you know, magnetic characterization with what we have in the lab is basically the using uh, the polar moke we can detect the magnetization reversal in the outer plane uh, with an outer plane heat sweep. And we see this typical, you know, like 100% remnants, uh, uh, you know, uh, signal with large positive. And if you measure all of the samples that we grew, we, you, you, as you can see that we can even tune very uh, effectively the coercivity from being tens of uh, tens of uh, earth step to hundreds of earth step, 600 earth step. So which means that we can also change the uh, uh, you know, anisotropy of the film very effectively. 
Okay. So one important aspect of this turbine garnet, as I mentioned it briefly before, is that it shows also some magnetic compensation at a certain certain temperature. So here, uh, one way of measuring the magnetic compensation in these films is basically checking the coercivity as a function of temperature. So in when the magnetization is compensated, the film should act like an antiferromagnet and the coercivity should diverge because of the vanishing Zeeman energy on the net magnetization. So this is what I'm showing you here. Uh, in the specific film that we studied here in one of them, uh, we, show, we, we saw that the magnetic compensation occurs slightly below 200 Kelvin. This was a surprising result to us because we thought that we were growing some stoichiometric, you know, perfectly, uh, you know, uh, bulk-like uh, films. But it's uh, not the case because in the bulk properties, the uh, compensation should occur at 250 Kelvin, but we are somewhat 50 Kelvin off the bulk. And uh, we wanted to explore the origin of this lower magnetic compensation. And we thought that, okay, so if uh, there is something, you know, some, there's some additional scattering inside the chamber during the deposition. And if that scattering of from the argon, you know, the plasma, uh, if that scattering is element selective, meaning that you have more scattering for terbium and less scattering for iron, maybe you get some off stoichiometry. And uh, we tried to uh, grow films with different target to sample distance, is the one that I mentioned before. But we did not see like a systematic changes in the, uh, in the uh, compensation temperature. So they are all kind of um, fluctuating around 200 Kelvin plus minus 20 Kelvin. And we said, okay, so are we really changing the stoichiometry this way? So to test this, we did some XPS measurement and we expected, you know, we saw that when we decrease the target to sample distance, as we also, we get closer to the bulk value, which is 0 0.6, so the terbium to iron ratio, the expected value. And, the, and this expected value, so there's a, this, Despite this very clear, convincing trend of changing stoichiometry with the target to sample distance, we did not see any clear indication that this uh, anomaly in the um, compensation comes from the stoichiometry. Therefore, the stoichiometry, as opposed, uh, as opposed to what is commonly believed, uh, does not really play as like a role as like a role in the magnetic compensation in these films, and uh, we believe that the nature of the terbium and oxygen vacancies and the strain states could play a, a more significant role. So we are right now in doing some additional experiment to uh, figure out what's going on with these films. Okay, so now let me show you some results on the current induced magnetization switching and domain wall motion. Okay, so. We we would like to basically do some current induced switching and detect the magnetization state by electrical means. But first, we need to, you know, be able to actually detect this magnetization by uh, using, uh, you know, simple uh, electrical measurements. So for that, we have, uh, thankfully, we have this effect called spin hole magnetic resistance. So spin hole magnetic resistance, I mean, you might be familiar with, but uh, if not, then in a nutshell, it's basically uh, if you have a bilayer system, which consists of a normal metal like platinum and a magnetic insulator or rare earth iron, insulator, whatever, uh, an insulating system, insulating magnets, the, the uh, due to the spin, you know, if you have a large spin hole effect in this metal, due to the uh, like uh, absorption or reflection of the spin current at the interface. So if you have collinear state, for example, between the spin accumulation and the magnetization, you have a reflection of the spin current. And if you have orthogonal, you know, alignment between this spin accumulation at the interface and the magnetization, then you have an absorption. Then this creates a tiny change in the longitudinal resistivity of the field, of the normal level. So even though the current doesn't go into the magnetic layer, you still get some kind of a magnetic resistance behavior. And apparently this magnetic resistance behavior also shows up in the transverse measurement, hole effect measurement. So in hole effect measurements, because of this reflection absorption phenomena, you have a, uh, a signal proportional to the uh, cross dot product of MX and Y within the scoring system. Plus due to the precession of the spin current around the magnetization, you also get an additional signal Due, uh, that is proportional to the Z component of the magnetization. So that's exactly like in the metallic case, 
but now you get uh, also some uh, planar hole and anomalous hole like behavior in the insulating case. So that we tested this on platinum cobium ion garlic bilayer, and we nicely see that you you can detect the uh, perpendicular magnetization, you know, very uh, effectively in a, by just passing through uh, by just passing current through platinum and reading the all voltage in uh, by using anomalous hole effect, and the, we also get this this other component that is proportional to the mx and y, which is basically a parent kind of you know, the magnetization in the 45 degrees. So this is the perpendicular magnet. And uh, that basically, uh, so PowerPoint is closed. I hope Zoom is not frozen. No, no, it's okay. I can't hear you. Yes, I just cannot switch. But if I wait for a few seconds, it's going to open. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Too fast. So, yeah. Um, okay. So now we are, we know uh, that we can detect the magnetization. So, what about spin orbit torque switching? So, spin orbit torque, we know that it works well in the metallic case. So, now we just apply this to an insulating case. So, we have a, a you know, garnet. Uh, garnet, we have a normal metal. We send a charge current that generates a spin current in the transverse direction because of the spin hole effect. And that spin current ge generates like a damping like work on the magnetization. And that is uh, can switch the magnetization between up and down state. So uh, in that, that the very same paper that, that uh, we published did, that I showed during the previous slide, we also showed that we can switch the magnetization with current densities on the order of 10 to the 11 amps per meter square uh, in the presence of an in-plane field because that in-plane field is required to break the rotational symmetry of the damping like effective field. Otherwise, the magnetization would just like recess around the torque, but uh, uh, to cannot be deterministically switched, switched, but you can break that symmetry by playing, by using an in-plane field. And by doing this kind of measurements as a function of an in-plane, different in-plane field, you can also see the switching diagram of the field. So where this uh, transition between blue and red is basically the critical current for a given uh, field value here. Later on, we had a follow-up study where we also showed that the same type of switching behavior occurs also for very short pulses in the in, in, the, you know, in the nanosecond pulses, basically. And uh, also, if you engineer your film very well, this in-plane field requirement can be as low as two Earth steps, which is extremely small. So basically, it can be very easily obtained on a given device by just uh, you know, putting some uh, bar magnets around it. So this shows uh, that you know um, the fast switching, especially here, it, it, it uh, uh, was like a signature of very fast moving domain wall because we know that spin orbital switching is basically domain initiation and domain wall propagation. So it's not like a single spin switching, but it's rather like you just nucleate a domain and then that propagates with the spin orbital. So based on some calculations, we said that, okay, this, the, the domain wall motion should be very effective in these fields. And uh, to test this hypothesis, so we, uh, we went to the next study where we patterned some devices here. So this now we are using the same bilayer film, platinum, cooling, modern garden. And this time is this green area is basically your, our domain wall track, which is this material. Dark area is basically the substrate. And you have this yellow part, which is basically the nucleation. So the main, uh, nucleation, uh, domain wall nucleation line. So what we wanted to do is basically nucleate a domain create a domain wall and study its current driven dynamics. And to do that, we have a, a we are using a focused laser uh, a MOOC uh, system, basically, which can detect the magnetization locally at a, at a given position in the device. So the first experiment that we do, um, we, we first uh, basically, uh, you know, just sweep the other plane field and check that there is, you know, we get the normal symmetric coercivity. So that's basically when there's no current flowing along the track and no current flowing around the nucleation line. Uh, in this case, the, 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 uh, the solid black line. So you see this is coercivity is fully symmetric, about a bit more than 30 of steps. 
And the second case, what we do is that we need so in the backward sweep, we need a field requirement to uh, move this domain wall. So we measure here, so we measure in this area, when we nucleate a domain, then the field requirement to switch or to the, the switch the whole uh, device is basically much lower. So this is what happens in the dashed area here. So nucleation is finite, but there is still no current flowing here. And then once we once uh, we inject a current uh, after nucleation to test the effect of the domain effect of the current on the domain wall, then we saw that depending on the current polarity, the coercivity is either increasing or decreasing. So which means that there's a certain amount of effective field or work applied on the domain wall that either makes uh, propagation easier or harder. So once we uh, characterize this, uh, you know, as a function of a applied current, uh, we saw that there's a linear relationship. So which means that there's really like a current induced effect on the domain wall, which also changes sign between up down versus down up domain wall. Um, so we know that the spin orbit fork or the damping light fork cannot act on the block type domain wall, which means that the domain wall cannot be block type, should be nail type. And uh, therefore, then we saw that actually, okay, that the, the domain walls, to our surprise, were nail type. Therefore, we are able to see this domain wall uh, motion. So to uh, quantify this uh, nail type domain wall, like uh, uh, the effective field that stabilizes these nail type domain walls, uh, by the way, these nail type domain walls are driven by an effect called gelatin scale. Uh, domain wall depending experiment in the presence of an in plane field. Because as you can imagine, so if you have some, so, so if, if it's nail type domain wall, then if we apply an in plane field, then you can just, you know, rotate the internal spin orientation of the domain wall into a block type and into an opposite nail type. So this is what we did here. So as you can see here that we, when we show the critical, so when we plot the critical current to start moving the domain wall in the presence of an in-plane field, we saw that there is a divergence at negative uh, 50 or step in the case of down-up domain wall and a divergence at positive 50 or step in the up-down domain wall. And this is explained like here, basically. So you have, Why it's frozen? Freezing. Okay. So imagine that now at zero field, you have fully nail type domain wall. If you apply a minus 50 or stat, then you contract this effective uh, VMI field and you get a block type domain wall. And then if you increase the implant field, then you make the nail type domain wall with the opposite chirality. Therefore, you need a different, you know, you need the opposite polarity of current to drive the same domain wall, as you can see here. So larger negative field, you need positive current and uh, the zero field or positive field, you need a negative current in the case of down up domain wall and the same uh, for the other up down domain wall. Okay, so then we wanted to understand it. Maybe the origin of it can only be driven by uh, the interfacial interaction. Therefore, we said, we said, okay, if it's an interfacial effect, it should change if we, if we go to another garnet, for instance, we change to bimiring garnet to terbimiring garnet, and again, we see the same behavior. Okay, so you need to believe me here, I will not explain all the details, but the VMI was there again with the terbimiring garnet. And we said, okay, if this is, if platinum maybe is giving the VMI, then if it is not, it was also not the case because when we disconnect platinum from the garden with a copper spacer, VMI was still there and still strong. And, and there was an, uh, it mean, and from this study and some follow-up studies that we have done, we have understood that the gelatin scheme interaction was coming from the substrate and garnet interface. So it's GGG and railroad iron garnet interface rather than the top metallic interface. And this uh, was also corroborated with some uh, parallel studies from uh, ETH, Zurich, 
uh, that they also that, uh, they have also done some additional you know uh, nitrogen vacancy center measurements on domain walls, and they also show that the DMI is coming mostly from the uh, substrate interface and not from the metal interface on top. And finally, we wanted to move these domain walls with uh, current. So, um, so we wanted to move these domain walls fast with current. So uh, the, I'm showing you here the current versus velocity versus current uh, in this fluvium iron garnet platinum bilayer. And there are two striking features. First of all, the domain wall velocities are quite fast. So it's reaching 800 meters per second and it's quite linear with current. And the transition between the creep regime to flow regime occurs at an extremely small uh, current density in the case of, uh, you know, in the order of three times, three times 10 to the 10 times per meter square. And this is, you know, uh, both the velocity and these numbers are quite, uh, you know, uh, high uh, or let's say uh, close to state of the art as we can, you know, uh, at that time in 2019. So, right. Now we know that you know the the more domain wall velocities could reach several kilometers per second for certain other systems, but uh, you know, at that time this almost one kilometer per second was was the uh, one of the largest values found, and also this uh, transition between creep and flow regime is basically kind of one of the lowest values. And the reason for these very fast velocities is basically uh, due to the ferrimagnetic behavior of the film, because uh, in the case of, you know, you know when you have fly spin orbit torque in a two sub lattice system, the torque is typically generated. So now you have the top view of the film, so you have this uh, white and gray uh, uh, magnetic sub lattices that are opposite to each other. And when you apply a current, yeah, there's a fork in the transverse direction, and that will, that wants to pull all I mean, pull all these these two sublattices towards the torque. But there's a restoring force on the sublattice, which is the exchange interaction, which is very strong. Therefore, due to this strong exchange interaction, the magnetization is never able to align with the torque direction, uh, uh, which prevents the velocity to sa to saturate. Because in a single ferromagnetic model, the velocity saturates when this fork is uh, you know, the torque value is comparable to the DMI effective field value. But although the DMI effective field in this case was very small, the restoring force is not the DMI effective field, but rather the exchange field. Therefore, it's much strong, it's much higher, therefore there's no saturation uh, in, a, uh, in the current uh, range that we use for these, in these studies. Okay, in the last maybe five minutes, I'm, I will try to go a little bit faster on this part, is I'm going to show you some uh, a new phenomenon that we have uh, discovered called thermal spin drive. And that is concerning a non-local detection of magnetization vector. So uh, now I'm going to discuss these non-local measurements uh, in the devices that look like this. So we have now a gold uh, heater here. So I mean, our idea was to study the uh, spin current, uh, you know, uh, no. Injection of spin current and detection of spin current in this kind of non local device which is uh, quite standard. So we we have we have a gold heater and uh, and some microns away we have this platinum detector. And platinum it has a large spin hole effect, therefore it can detect when spin current goes into this platinum from the fluid bottom line. So here I need to say that we are interested in purely thermally driven signals and not the long range background transport that's usually required and also spin current injection from this side, but this gold is basically disconnected from fully mild incarnate by some oxide. So there's no spin current injection from here. It's purely thermal. Uh, you know, this this serves just to create a temperature gradient in the film. Um, so the temperature gradient that we are uh, uh, you know expecting is that there's underneath gold you have this vertical temperature gradient, but underneath platinum you have this uh, mixed term temperature gradient. So we have an in-plane gradient and out-of-plane gradient combined because of the three-dimensional um, dissipation of the heat. Uh, so first uh, I'm showing you some, uh, you know, signals the second harmonic signal, which is basically related to the thermal gradient in the platinum channel, 
by rotating the sample into in a fixed magnetic field of 500 millipascal. So this is the in-plane rotation. As you can see, there's like a complex uh, sinusoidal behavior, which we did not understand in the beginning. But then after analyzing this, we actually were able to find out that it's coming from two different ends, which is basically this uh, cosine behavior plus sine phi behavior. And that is due to the spin Zeebig effect. And that is purely a spin current pumped from two rewiring on a two platinum by you know, thermal excitations, thermal magnons. And that is converted into a voltage by in the spin hall effect. Another effect that we found out that is due to this inverse magnet resistance, because as I explained to you before, uh, this like the spin hole magnet resistance, uh, uh, you know, it acts, it acts like a spin hole magnet resistance, but in, in, uh, instead of uh, an in plane charge current, now we have an in plane thermal current, so temperature gradient. So that is the driving force. And then you get a sine 2 phi behavior as well. So basically, this signal was a convolution of cosine phi plus sine 2 phi, which we understand as spin Zeebeck effect and spin Morse magnetic resistance. And these two are based, um, you know, these two effects were not new to us, but it was a way to confirm that we have these two gradients operating together. The interesting observation came out when we did an out of thing because we saw uh, that there was also a kind of a signal that was occurring in other thing field strip. So this sample was um, magnetized in plane. So therefore you don't see this very clearly. We said, okay, so there is something here, but we don't understand very well. So let's make some perpendicularly magnetized field. So in that it was more clear. So this is an out of plane tool environment diamond. And as you can see here, there's a very clear out of plane, you know, signal proportional to the method. Z component of the magnetization. And that was not something we understood at that time because it was not explainable by uh, ex existing phenomena. Okay, so you might wonder, okay, so there was an anomalous Hall effect signal, why not at the thermal counterpart? So to find out if the thermal counterpart could explain that, we did some experiments that is basically just comparing like two different devices that are very similar, you know, geometry and characteristics next to each other. One is driven, we we measured the signal driven by purely electrical currents, and the other one is purely uh, thermal uh, gradients. And the in-plane signal, uh, you know, we have this uh, these two signals that basically are basically you know, the electrical and thermal counterparts. But then the other plane signal, in the case of uh, electrically driven signal, we have a very small. But in the case of thermally driven signal, we have a large signal. So it, there was a one-to-one -one correspondence. The expected signal would have been like this, this red one. But then we had, you know, somewhat mm, 10 times larger signal than what we expect. So our explanation to that was, is basically that the, um, this could be due to the combined action of the out-of-plane gradients pumping a spin current into platinum with an out-of-plane polarization. Then you get an in-plane temperature gradient that also kind of drag this spin current along a certain direction. And then you have the final uh, inverse spin Hall effect voltage uh, coming in, you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the third direction. So that is basically uh, an, an effect that was not known before and that we call the term spin drag. And then they put in some numbers such as, uh, you know, the Zabeck coefficient and the Nernst uh, Hall angle, et cetera. So we expect this platinum free electron polarization on the order of 25%. Okay, so after, you know, just uh, one slide on some future directions. So um, on the rare earth iron gardens, I think there's still much uh, that we can do. So first on first part is that we can improve the current induced magnetization control by using some, you know, combination of materials with this rare earth, rare earth iron gardens. For example, using heavy metals different than platinum that has been not much explored so far, just maybe tanks, just on only tungsten. <clears throat> we can use this new, you know, this emerging effect from two dimensional electron gas or metal oxide interfaces, some topological effects like while semi metals or topological instruments. <clears throat> we could also try to functionalize the devices by basically playing the magnetic properties of the garnets <clears throat> during the operation by using, for instance, this electric 
piece of control dynamic string. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, we could use use flexible substrates or combine this material with multiple trees. <clears throat> and um, finally, the last challenge is that we, I mean, okay, I've shown you some ways to detect magnetization by in local and non-local devices, but these signals are uh, either very small so far or not very compatible with the induction because you cannot make all but all bars all effective uh, measurement <coughs> to, to make like a, a memory um, if you want to build like a memory element so you need to adapt your uh, your, your detection technique so spinal magnetism is good but it's not enough is not the geometry is not enough specific effect can only detect an in-plane component and not the out-of-plane component thermal spin drag Still very small signal, so not very familiar. So we need technology compatible new effects, and we are working on it. So I uh, cannot uh, you know, disclose these data yet, but uh, we have been able to uh, find you know like a simpler way to detect magnetization. <coughs> we were doing this uh, garnet fields by using in a simpler geometry, yes. and all these things can be combined to develop highly efficient conventional uh, binary memory and logic elements such as uh, MRAM, the racetrack and beyond, or also some like uh, post-CMOS uh, technologies such like analog like uh, memories like for narrow neuromorphic computing, magnetic logic and data, data processing for beyond CMOS computing as well. So with this last uh, uh, slide, I would like to thank, uh, uh, first of all, you for, uh, for your attention and for listening to this uh, talk. But also to my team members here who also, uh, you know, help us uh, grow and understand some properties of these films and make some devices and test those devices. Uh, my postdoc uh, advisors at MIT, collaborators, Professor Jeff Peach, my, my advisor, and Pro Professor Caroline Ross, and uh, my PhD supervisor and also postdoc advisor from ETH, uh, Professor Christo van der Della, and, and of course our funding. So we have. Now, the majority of our uh, current funding is coming from CRC starting grants uh, that will run until 2026. That is dedicated on magnetic insulators, but also some uh, national funding and other international funding that we have, been, uh, you know, we have been handling so far in the past uh, couple of months. Um, and uh, just to finish, and maybe uh, you know, like some advertisement. So uh, we are. Uh, we will have some uh, PhD and postdoc positions available starting in fall 2023. So if you're interested, please send them your CV and brief research statement, and um, I will look into that, into those uh, <clears throat> applications. But also, we also support local and international fellowship applications if you have any, you know, exciting idea in mind and want to get funding for it. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> This, thank you, Jan. This has been a really amazing talk. Um, I enjoyed the different aspects, different phenomena you show in iron, uh, iron and rubber based garment. So uh, I would like, like to open the session to, to questions. I have a few questions, uh, but if anyone wants to start, uh, or in any case, I can start. Okay, I will start. Uh, so uh, uh, First, in, in slide 16, you show the, the you try to, to determine the, the compensation temperature of your of your garments. Yeah, um, you, can, you, you can go back to, to that slide. Yeah, in that one, you, you mentioned that at 250 is uh, the compensation of your bulk, then at 190 degrees, you have the, the divergence of your worsty field, but um, at 150K, you also have a, a, a reduction of the magnetization. What does this uh, mean? So, okay, so I did not uh, explain very much in detail, but these are not the magnetization data, but rather the whole effect data. So the whole effect data has another anomaly in these films that are independent of the magnetic compensation that it also change sign at certain temperature. So there is a sign reversal. So basically there are two things happening 
uh, here. Um, one is that the, there's a coercivity increase that is, you know, you can associate that easily with the uh, compensation uh, uh, temperature, but there's also the whole effect that changes, you know, amplitude and also sign both through the compensation temperature, but also at another temperature, that's another critical temperature that we don't understand why, but the anomalous fall effect, basically, it has a very complex behavior in this uh, in this system. So what we, uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think in this 150K, it's it's just not visible here in the, uh, the jump, but, uh, uh, it's basically the you know the, when the, the sublattice magnetization changes sign, you have a flip of the anomalous fall effect signal, but the continuous change. I mean, there is a and on the background there is a continuous temperature dependence of the anomalous fall effect. So that's why you it seems like you have like a double sign change, but only one of them could be associated with the uh, um, you know magnetic compensation because that's where the, the you know you see this divergence of the data let's say if you want to quantify your magnetic compensation and not the sign of the anomalous fall effect in this system okay I, I think i made it more complicated than it sounds no, 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 okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay it's okay thank you okay i maybe i i can show you maybe and because there is another data so if you just if you can check the paper i think it will be easier to understand because there's another set of data which i did not show but that also shows the temperature evolution of the anomalous fall effect coefficient at, you know independently of the compensation temperature so then you get some kind of a weird interplay uh at the around 150 and 100 come together a bit. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, thank you. I also have another question. Uh, I saw you, um, you measure uh, really high velocities in your domain wall, uh, close to one uh, kilometer per second. How, um, how is uh, the dependence with the compensation temperature of the velocity? Yes. <clears throat> Okay, so that is something that we are curious also. So we uh, we would like to measure that, but it's not easy to implement temperature dependent, you know, high velocity domain wall measurements, uh, unfortunately for for us. But we are we are working on it. So in the case of Kulimar and Garnet, we did not try because temperature. I mean, I, I think it's one point five Kelvin. So it's not a good system to study that. So let's see. So for the best study, best system to study the effect of compensation temperature on domain wall velocity is basically uh, fermium iron garnet, gadolinium iron garnet, europium iron garnet, where the compensation temperature is kind of floating around 200, 250 Kelvin. So those are more accessible temperatures in terms of measurements. But currently, we are still working on an upgrade of our system. So we, I cannot tell. You know, maybe in one year from now, I can tell you something more. But right now, we are. It's a work in progress. But independently of this, we expect also, like in the case of uh, metallic systems, we also expect like a divergence of the velocity, or at least an enhancement of the velocity around the angular momentum compensation, not the magnetic compensation. Uh, and it, so, which is also something unknown to us because you know it's not we also that it's not a perfect system so it's not stoich fully stoichiometric it, it departs from the bulk uh, properties so the calculation of that angular momentum compensation is not also is not so straightforward. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Cynthia has a question. Please go ahead. Thank you, Luis. Uh, thank you. Can for for the nice talk. Uh, I have a very simple question, which is, which is the in the the lattice parameter or for tuning it? Yes, it's for it's for the lattice parameter mostly. So, so it's uh, uh, you know, GGG is a is a substrate which is commercially available. Mm -hmm. 
And you can also, I mean, a pure GGG has a certain, you know, I think 12.38 angstrom, but they also use some doping to tune that notice parameter very, you know, precisely. So uh, then you can match your GGG substrate to any material that you want to, you know, any rare earth iron garnet that you want to grow on top. If you want to obtain some, some uh, strength, mm -hmm. uh, that's for uh, epitaxial matching. Mm -hmm. substrate. And all of them uh, have the, the very same like topography, right? Because here in this uh, slide, 25, you are showing the the speed of the domain wall as a function of the current, which is the, the driving force that you have here. And I can understand that you have in the low uh, speed regime, you're like in a creep motion yeah. regime, right? Yes. And this is very much related with the topography. So are all the, the, the substrates uh, equal in terms of the defects, topographical defects that you may have? Yeah, I mean, that's a also like, um, that's a question that we were asking ourselves uh, before, because these, I mean, during all these studies, I have never seen a single domain in, you know, in my, I mean, until that point, you know, 2029, uh, in, in that material, because we always use this, uh, uh, you know, uh, Spot. this laser mock, so we, we don't, you know, we don't know what is, what, uh, what the, the nature of the domain walls are. Of the domains are right now we have a bit better idea so we grow our films and depending on the growth parameters and depend, depending on the substrate itself even though two substrates are identical we see that there are certain substrate they show some very you know triangular uh, grains where they you get a lot of pinning mm -hmm. some of them are like point like defects so you know the, the grain uh, morphology of the uh, sample or let's say the, the pinning uh, potential of the sample it depends very sensitively on the substrate even though well, between two like identical nominally identical substrate you can get two different uh, two different um, properties or two different behavior and or or you can get you know if you slightly change your deposition parameter you also get some different behavior so it's not something that is very easily controlled so we were lucky on this um, this particular sample that it, the pinning was very yeah uh, very small so we were able to go from creep regime to flow regime at a very low uh, current uh, but you know it's not so straight I mean now I mean looking back now I see that it's not so straightforward we were just lucky to find a couple of good Examples. Yeah. yeah, I see. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Jan. Antonio has a question. Yes. There, go ahead. Are you hearing me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for thank you for the nice talk. Uh, please, can you show me the can show us the slide number twenty four? That's right. Thank you. Uh, actually, I missed the explanation. If my line width decreased a lot, uh, why did you, do, when you separate the platinum from, from the terbium iron garnet, and can you please okay. explain a little bit? So Oh, yeah, sorry, I did not explain this last. Yes. Actually, I missed it. Right side of the slide, because you know it, you did not miss it. I did not explain. <laughs> so it's my fault. Thank you. So it's uh, it's it's because this, these are not our measurements. This is a paper from oh. uh, you know this reference, so which was basically a parallel. Oh. But I mean, just I know. I mean, this is Pietro's. I mean, a work basically. So. I was working with uh, at MIT and Jeff Peach and then Pietro okay, did, okay. I mean, they did like a similar uh, work on tulium iron garnet, but these are not FMR measurements. These are basically uh, the line scans of this NV microscopy. So uh, these line scans are um, the, you know, the dots, the dots, so the black, Dots here are the uh, straight field that comes out of this domain wall. So basically, they make like a line scan, and then 
uh, when they, there is a stray field, there is an in increase or decrease of the signal. So if they look like fMR measurement, that they are okay. Uh, they are not fMR. Actually, I'm talking these, to the just, left mm, results. Uh, this one. Oh, okay. yeah, that's right. So these are based, are these fMR oh, measurement? These are not fMR oh. measurement. These are basically okay. the, uh, the uh, changes in the coercivity. So delta. Right, so the delta it means that this is the change in the coercivity in the in, uh, as a function of current oh, okay. in measurements okay. that look okay. like okay. this. This basically. Okay. So delta okay. is for me is like this between oh, red okay. and blue. Okay. Or so this is the current, negative current, positive current. It changes one side or the other side. I also increase linear. Which means that the domain wall responds. To the current in a linear way, meaning that there's certain okay. torque. At, uh, okay, moment. sorry for the mistake. Yeah. Actually, a long time I be as a function of temperature to measure the 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 compass area. Okay, thank you. Once more. Thank you, Antonio. <coughs> thank you, Jan. Okay, um, if there is there any other question. Yeah, if not, uh, please let's uh, thank uh, Jan again for this amazing talk and thank you for being part of your seminar. This is our first seminar of the year and um, thank you again. You're welcome to share your, your work with, with us uh, whenever you want. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Uh, I also enjoyed a lot. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to, to show our work here. And uh, yeah, I hope we meet soon somewhere in uh, some conferences or some scientific events. Or if you come to Barcelona at some point, so just uh, you are good to me. Feel free to contact me. Yeah, 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 for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So with this, I finish uh, the first seminar of the year and see you again next, next week.